good Monday morning and welcome to the Ninja Chickens channel. My name is Maria and I'll be your host today for this Fibery podcast. Uh, it is about 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. on Monday morning, the 23rd of July, and I'm sitting out by my pond hoping to get this podcast in before the rain starts. I know that uh, in many places of the world they are having big drought and a lot of fires and I'm hoping that some of this rain will head your way after it hits here. It seems like we've had an extremely wet spring and summer compared to what we usually have. So um, maybe these clouds will head your way. I've been thinking about you guys in California and Sweden and Ireland and all those other places that are having super, super dry weather. Um, my name is Maria, and you can find me on Instagram as ninja.chickens. Dot chickens. You can find me on Ravelry as Ninja Chickens, and you can find all the show notes on my website at ninjachickens.org. We're going to chat a bit about knitting today and a lot about color, eco printing, natural dyeing, all that good stuff. But first, I wanted to announce the winner for the Potluck Pullover giveaway. The Potluck Pullover was announced um, last podcast. It's a beautiful new sweater, and by Victoria Zakanowicz, and it is a multicolored sweater with lots of scraps, like a scrappy sweater, a great first knit if you're knitting your first sweater. And there were lots of entries. I asked, what, how would you knit it? Would you knit it with lots of scraps or different color patterns, stuff like that? And the winner was Mandy3277, and she said, this looks like such a wonderful knit. I'm thinking I would do it in three different colors that complement each other, maybe adding a thin stripe between the colors from a contrasting mini skein. I think that sounds beautiful. So congratulations, Mandy. That is your sweater pattern now, and I will contact Victoria and have her send that over to you. I appreciate everyone who participates in the giveaways. They're a lot of fun. It's a fun way to interact with you guys and, um, and to give back to the knitting community. So... Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, everyone who entered. So today, as far as knitting, um, last week I showed you my butterfly socks that I was knitting in Prado de Lana's Felicity, and they are finished. I really liked doing this stitch pattern. It was a lot of fun and um, a lot simpler than I thought. I had seen this stitch pattern in a hat before, and I thought it was beautiful, but just thought, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do that and didn't think to look it up. <laughs> simple enough to look it up, right? And when I looked it up, it was really simple. It's just a slip stitch that you catch. And I thought it was really pretty. And I may go back and knit the hat sometime because I like how this looks. So I knit this in the uh, fleece, the yarn from the fleece that Felicity produced, who is a Romney sheep out on Prada Delana farm. So if you're interested in learning more about Romney, Louise of the Knit British audio podcast did a great review of it on her latest podcast. And she has, um, every so often she does a breed review and has people knit, spin, work with the yarn and give their, their input on how it, how it worked for them. And Romney was the latest one that she did, and there's a lot of information about the breed, about where it comes from, about the yarn, the stability of it, the strength, all that stuff. So if you're interested in learning more about the Romney breed, um, I would suggest listening to her latest audio podcast. Romney is a really good workhorse yarn. It's got a long staple that is a, a thicker micron count than Merino, so it's not as soft as Merino that a lot of people are used to but it's still fairly soft and this especially for socks is going to be a really sturdy sock um, and it's not so itchy or you know rustic that you wouldn't want to wear it in a sweater either it's a beautiful yarn so i'm excited to see how these wear i am also planning on dipping these in a fresh indigo vat so when i say fresh indigo that means i gather the leaves that i've got around me and um Blend them in ice water, keep them cold so that they don't start oxidizing. Strain them out, blend them again, strain them out, and then um, use that really cold um, strained water as the dye bath. 
and it w it looks like a vibrant emerald green but when you take the yarn out of it or the the socks out of it it turns an aqua blue it's a really beautiful color so i'm excited to do that i don't have a lot of fresh indigo this year my um my patch got mowed over unfortunately i have some that's frozen a couple pounds that are frozen from last year and i have a small patch that reseeded itself from last year but um Japanese indigo that a lot of you guys will hear people talk about or it's called polygonum or persicaria tinctorum uh, is part of the buckwheat family and it's also called knotweed. There is a species of polygonum or buckwheat that grows rampantly in my yard. It's all over the place and it's just like a little grass and looks very similar to the indigo that I grow for dye material. The research that I have done shows that most of that knotweed family has a small amount of the, the chemical in it to produce the blue. It's just that the Japanese indigo has more. So I'm curious, instead of having to take so much extra space and time to try to um, baby a plant that doesn't grow naturally around here, why not gather all the the knotweed that I have around here and try a fresh bath? So I'm going to do that hopefully sometime in August to see what kind of color I can get out of it. Because wouldn't that be cool if I could get blue, even if it was just a little bit, a light blue, out of some of the plants that already grow here. So I'm, I took a little video of it so I could show you the, the, the two plants that are in the yard, and I'll show you that right now. So this is a patch of... Uh, indigo that reseeded itself in my yard. And here is one flowering. You can see. There we go. So if you look at the stems and how they, the leaves grow, I want to show you the local variety. So here's the local variety in my yard very similar stems and leaves. It looks almost exactly the same. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the seeds or flowers, you would think it was the same plant. And I'll show you that. And here's this one. They look exactly the same to me. So this is another member of the polygonum family or the buckwheat family. And indigo, the kind that I grow, is uh, polygonum tinctorum or persicaria tinctorum. They're the same thing. They just have two different names. Some people call it Japanese indigo. And it looks just like this. Supposedly this has some of the blue pigment in it also. So I figure since it's all over the yard, why not try it and see if I can get a little out of it because it grows so easily around here. So that was my one finished object. And I have um, just one work in progress right now. I know I mentioned working on a sock pattern a few episodes ago, and Mars of Hay Brown Berry and Dynamics Yarn and I have been looking for the right sock yarn for months. We were having a really hard time finding a sturdy sock yarn that didn't have nylon or, um, or was superwash. And we ended up finding a really beautiful yarn that came from the UK that's a 100% Coriadale, that's a high twist Coriadale. And Coriadale um, is known for being a soft but sturdy yarn. And this specifically is supposed to be a good sock yarn. So she got that and she dyed some up and I've started knitting the pattern in that yarn. And I'm loving it so far. I had a lot more than this and discovered <clears throat> my gauge was way too tight, so I ripped it back and I'm starting back over again right now on a size US 2. And this is the yarn, and you can see how nice that twist is. Um, this is going to be the main color of the sock, and it's really, and it also has a bit of a sheen and a nice fuzzy halo to it. What I've found from high twist yarns is that once you've knit them and soaked them, they really plump up because all of that, all that fiber has been twisted tightly 
into it and when it relaxes a little bit after it's been knit it plumps and makes a really beautiful piece so I'm excited to see how this plumps up when it's after it's been blocked um, I'm probably gonna have the first sock done the pattern is pretty much written I just want to go through it one more time and make sure that it uh, it all makes sense and I'll probably have it done in the next couple of days so if anyone is interested in test knitting I don't think I have I don't I don't have the other sock that I finished it's a color work sock with um, one main color and four alternate colors and if anyone's interested in test knitting it'll be a fairly long test knit because I won't be able to publish it before I go on my next trip but I'm looking for testers just let me know Mars does have some kits uh, dyed up so um, you can get do it in the same colors as I did if you're interested. I will post official details on Instagram as soon as I'm done but um, feel free to shoot me an email or uh, leave me a note if you're interested. So that's my only work in progress right now and that's all I really want to knit on. <laughs> I want to finish it and see how it looks because this yarn is it's really nice to knit with. Um, it feels in a good way like a superwash yarn. Sometimes superwash to me feels too slippery, like it doesn't, uh, it slides through your fingers too much. This has a nice soft feel to it, but still um, a good grippy texture, if that makes sense. It's not a rustic yarn by any means. It's very soft, but it feels, it still feels like wool. So, um, so yeah, and I'm excited to see how these wear also because Corey Dale is supposed to be a really nice one for socks. So non-superwash, high twist, and that's my only work in progress. Speaking of non-superwash, high twist, though, I went up to Echo View Fiber Mill uh, this past Friday. We have been working on a collaboration together, and uh, it's not all completely done yet but I did want to show you some of what we've been working on they have a new line of yarns coming out so Echo View if you guys don't know is the mill local to me and they are a uh, LED certified sustainable mill they run off of solar power they have a fair living wage like it's it's the best business model you can imagine it's really really good giving back to the community and the people who work there um, and they are interested in sustainable yarns. They do natural dyeing, all kinds of stuff. So they uh, are, have are started a new line of yarns that's going to be made from all American merino, um, and asked me if I wanted, if I was interested in a sock yarn like that, and I said absolutely. So they scanned up two types for me. One is 100% merino, which is this one. It's 100% American merino with a high twist. And it's really beautiful. It's got a nice sheen to it. It's soft. The twist is great. And it plumps up beautifully when it's been knit. And then the other one is 30% or sorry, 70% merino and 30% tencel. So again, a nice, a nice twist to it. And uh, the tencel is made out of eucalyptus fiber. So it gives it a strength, just like nylon would, but it's made out of a sustainable product. And the reason why, if I haven't explained it before, the reason why I'm excited about the high twist is because the more tightly twisted a yarn is, the, the sturdier it, 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 it will be. So if you think of a single ply, uh, it's easy to kind of just pull that apart. If you think of something that's got six plies in it um, and is twisted up tightly, that's going to hold things together well. So this is so this is a, a three ply yarn that's tightly twisted. So the fibers are held in place and don't pull apart as easily. And that's important when you're wearing your socks because you're rubbing the ground and rubbing your heels on your shoes, wearing the sock down more quickly. It's not as big a deal if you're using it in a shawl that just drapes on your shoulders when you wear it. But if you're wearing a sock that's, gonna w that's going to uh, rub down in your shoes or on the floor, then this is going to last longer. So I'm really excited about these. 
right now they're making them into sock blanks for me so that I can see how these die up and potentially have a sock blank with an um, all-American merino, tensile, sustainable strength, and a good solid sock yarn. So I'm super excited about that. More will be coming out about that in the next couple of months, but keep your eyes open because I think they're going to be gorgeous. So these past couple of weeks have been really busy for me because I've been doing a lot of eco printing. I'm going to be heading back up to Maine for the Wool Scouts retreat in uh, mid, early mid-August. And if you don't know about that retreat, you have to look up Wool Scouts retreat. It is an amazing retreat for knitters who also like other crafty and adventurous things. It is up in the Northwoods of Maine. It's only accessible by a float plane, so you get into um, Bangor, Maine, and then take a float plane for about a 40-minute ride out over the mountains. You see it go from city to nothing but wilderness and land on a lake where there's a camp. Uh, the camp is absolutely beautiful. Beautiful cabins and gardens, and there's fly fishing, and there's canoes, and the food is amazing. And you spend your time out there learning about all the things um, wild and woolly. There, are, Mary Jane Mucklestone is going to be doing some classes. I'm going to be doing some eco printing. There will be flint and steel fire starting, fly fishing, hiking, all kinds of stuff. If you're interested in a retreat and you have some time, I think there's a space or two available. It, and it's fabulous. So I'm going to be gone for a little bit and completely off the grid because there's no cell signal, there's no Wi-Fi. I mean, they have emergency contact if you need to get in touch with someone. But basically, you are off the grid. You are unplugged for a while, and it feels really amazing. So um, I've been printing up a bunch of stuff, knowing that I'm going to be gone. And then I have two classes coming up in September. I'm going to be doing one on September 23rd, which is the first day of fall, at the Lady Luck Flower Farm which is not far from here. They have amazing gardens and we're gonna pick our flowers and learn about eco printing. And we'll be doing paper, silk noil and silk uh, scarves out there. And there are still some spaces available and I'll have links to everything in the notes and on the bottoms in case you're interested in a class. And then there's another local class that I'm doing with EcoView and I'm gonna be doing sock blank eco printing and that will be on September 1st. And we'll be doing sock blanks as well as uh, silk and picking our flowers and our leaves and learning all about dyes, what plants create color and what plants don't and how to get a print with those that don't um, create color. So two local classes, one at a retreat, and I'm hoping to continue to do more um, probably in the spring of next year. So I have been really busy doing some printing so that I have lots of things to release throughout the fall. But the first thing I wanted to show you was something that I printed up for my neighbors who are getting married next month. And um, they love gardening, they love working the land, and I thought it would be nice to have something for them that was made from the plants on the land. So this is for um, the broom. I made him a, he wears a lot of t-shirts, so I made him a t-shirt, let's see, that has all kinds of beautiful prints, maple and goldenrod and marigold, and the main color is logwood, and then I added just a touch of iron to it so that it would go a little gray, and I think that's beautiful. And then for his fiance, I made a very large silk. This one was dyed first with uh, Queen Anne's lace and then printed and I don't you know they may not want to wear these at the wedding but I thought they actually go nicely together these two colors and hopefully that'll be something nice for them to take with them they're actually gonna be moving out in a couple of months they've lived on our land for almost four years now I think and so I thought it would be nice to have these 
to go with them. Um, I did one other, I wasn't sure if the Queen Anne's Lace, I'd not printed with that before, but we have so much of it around our yard, I thought I would give it a try. It made a beautiful yellow and ended up being a really pretty silk, but I wasn't sure how it would turn out, so I did a second one just in case. And this one is cochineal um, in, as the main color, and then maple and black walnut, and eucalyptus and lots of other colors in the back or on the on as a print so we we had a vote in the house and everybody liked the yellow one so we're going with that um i also did a lot of soft blanks and there's going to be lots of different colors i'm trying to use as much as i can from the yard while it's summertime because it won't be here all year and so i did a lot with um, Queen Anne's Lace, and that's this one, and then it has a matter with it also, and I really love how that turned out. So I'm, the, these are all going to be in the release, not all of them. Some of these will be in the release next weekend, July 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll have them up in the Etsy store. I'm also stockpiling a bunch for the big release in October for the Not Everybody Goes to Rhinebeck Festival, virtual festival, so that people who don't go to Rhinebeck can also enjoy um, a fun weekend that's going to be a bunch of vendors, you know, having releases, but also I think we're having some virtual knit nights, and I've, since apple cider donuts are such a big deal at Rhinebeck, I made an apple cider donut tea recipe. And it's delicious. I've already tried it. So I will I'll put that recipe out in the podcast uh, and on my website probably in September when I get back from Wool Scouts. That way you have time to gather the things if you want to have apple cider tea, donut tea during the weekend. During the, not, during the Rhinebeck weekend. Um, but here are some other things. This one is logwood. No, I'm sorry, this is avocado. Avocado with eucalyptus and butterfly pea flower. This one is madder with fern and agrimony. Look at that. Isn't that pretty? I love So fern is one that does not put out much color, but you can still make a print with it if you make it the resist. And I love the orange that turned out with that with the madder. Um, this one is also madder. So you can see the difference. This one is also matter, but it was on top of butterfly pea flower. So if you look at the back of it, you see that kind of bluey green, and then the matter was on the top. And that's another one with fern. And then I do some that I know everybody always likes the indigo, Saxon indigo with eucalyptus. This is a very light hint of blue on it with the eucalyptus. Aren't those pretty? And these are all on my 100% wool base. It's a, um, it's a non-superwash yarn. And I've made a sweater and I've made some socks out of it and they're holding up really well. Of course, you're you know, gonna wanna hand wash them and treat them gently as you would any hand knit socks but they're doing really well. So, yes, I think, oh, here's one more. I think this one I'm keeping. <laughs> this one was a logwood background, but I just love how this one printed up. Oh my goodness, I'm showing you the wrong side. It's even prettier on the right side. <laughs> So as far as dyeing and eco-printing, I've had a, a number of people ask me the best herbs to grow or the best plants to grow for natural dyeing. And there are two answers to that. The first one is if you actually want to physically grow something. Um, I think marigold is a really nice one to start with. And I'm not talking about pot marigold um, or calendula, which is still a good dye plant. But I find one that's even easier to grow and produces a lot of color is the Tegetti's species of marigold. 
and it grows super easily. It reseeds itself very easily. So if you let some of the flowers go to seed, um, if you have a garden space for it, and it's not in a pot, then you'll probably get some the next year. And if you pick the flowers as they bloom, you can throw them in, in your freezer or um, dry them. And it continues to bloom for a long time, usually till the first frost. And I know that there are varieties of marigold that grow in most places. From marigold, you can get a really lovely golden yellow. You can get a pale yellow, an almost orange. You can even get a, a bit of a green if you add a pinch of iron to it. So it's a really nice color to start with. It can use a mordant to help the color stay more fast, but you don't necessarily have to have one. If you're just wanting to play around, you can print with it. You can, um, you know, put it on a piece of paper and hammer it on the paper and see what the color comes out like. And you can use it for naturally dyeing yarn and clothing. That was my first thought as far as growing an, uh, an herb specifically for eco printing. It also has historical uses in um, energetic medicine, magic medicine, especially in Central America. So that's really interesting. If you're into that, you can look up what, what it's been used for in medicine. The other thing, the second thing I would encourage you guys to do if you're interested in using color is to look at what's around you because there are so many plants out there that create color. Not all of them are going to be color fast. Not all of them are going to stay through many washes and, and many, um, you know, being out in the sun and stuff like that. But if you're just starting with using natural color, there's nothing wrong with starting with what's around you because you don't have to grow indigo or matter or weld or those traditional dye colors to be able to start eco printing. In fact, or, or to be able to start natural dyeing, some really fun way to a really fun way to do it this time of year is solar dyeing, which is where you put your yarn or your fabric in a mason jar and put your plant material in there with it, with some water, cover it up, put it out in the sun and let it sit for a while. And that's a fun way to see what kind of color you can get out of something. And just to play with it, you know, and if you get some um, mini skeins of yarn that you're willing to play with and, and see what kind of color you get and you don't, you're not going to be upset if it doesn't dye the, the right color, you could get a bunch of mini skeins out of one skein of yarn and do a bunch of trials. Um, and if you live in an apartment and you have no greenery immediately around you, then I would advise you to ask because People get really interested when you talk to them about getting color from plants. The, my, some of the best maples that I get for printing, I get from a beautiful burgundy maple tree that is in the parking lot where I get my pet food. And I asked the woman who owns the store, do you mind if I pick a few leaves? She said, absolutely not. And whenever I print something with them, she wants me to bring it to show her. And so I get those leaves from her. And um, you know, a few years back when we were using lupine to dye, yarn, lupine, uh, purple lupine or lupin makes a really beautiful teal color. <clears throat> and there's a college near here that has a big field of lupine. And I called the college and got in touch with the man who manages the grounds. And he said, absolutely, that sounds like a lot of fun. So we went out there and harvested those. So you don't necessarily have to grow the plants in your yard. And if you don't have a yard, then go out and look. Because even things in the sidewalks, you know, like Dandelion makes great color. Um, many of the things that people consider noxious weeds make nice color. So I, I would advise um, learning what's around you and playing with it. You know, maybe uh, just get some, some silk noil and, or it's just like silk fabric, inexpensive silk fabric, and you can mordant it with alum, the same alum sulfate, the same way you would yarn, or even with soy milk or with tannins, and cut it into little squares, and just do small amounts to see what colors you get, and take notes, and that way if you find something that you really love, you can repeat it. If you don't know how to identify the plants, then you can always get a good identification book. There are a lot out there specific to the regions that you live in. So 
definitely get yourself one of those. That way you can learn about the plants that are immediately around you and see what you have available. But if you want to grow one in a pot or in your garden, then I would start, if you've never done any dying weed before, I would start with marigold. It's an easy one to grow. It's, it's harvested for a long period of time all throughout the summer and into the fall, and it gives you a lot of color to play with. Oh, as far as dye books, I have a bunch. And I'll put a picture in to show you just some of the ones that I've got. But probably one of my favorites right now is called Wild Color by Jenny Dean. And the reason why I like it the most is because it does stuff like this. It has a picture of the plant and then a picture of what you get without a mordant, with alum, with iron, or with alum and iron. And it does that for every plant. So, hardy hibiscus. Um, St. John's wort, the flowers and the tops. And there's a good write-up on how to grow it, how to, how to harvest, and how to dye um, with it. So this is a nice one, especially as a good, especially as a good uh, first dye book. There are many others out there, some of them even specific to the area where you live. If you're interested in getting into a lot more of the technical stuff about dyeing, then The Art and Craft of Natural Dyeing by Jay Lyles is a really good one. This one has no pictures. It is, well, it has a very small section of pictures in the middle. But it is all about, um, it's a lot more about the chemistry of the dyeing and how to create, how to create color and many different recipes. So that's another one that I recommend. The last thing I wanted to tell you guys about is, um, the opening music that I have on my podcast, a lot of people have asked me about that in the past. It is a group called uh, Rising Appalachia, and it is, was started by two sisters who are amazing musicians, and they've been playing for years now and put out a lot of really good Appalachian and New Orleans style music. And I mention them now specifically because they're on tour doing... It's called Resilient Europe Tour. So they come around my area a lot, but they don't go over to Europe that much. So if they're a band that you're really interested in, if you like their music, I would look up Rising Appalachia. And they, I think, are starting touring next month in Europe. And maybe we'll be coming by you. They're a really fun group to watch. It's a, a, a group that you'll really get into just moving with the music and dancing and they're very lively and and put on a good show so i think that's it for today i hope it didn't feel too rushed we're supposed to be getting more rain more thunderstorms um, in just another hour so i was trying to get out outside before that started and um yeah we've been getting thunderstorms pretty much every day the kind that come in and just torrential actually yesterday i was out in the hammock after two really busy weeks, um, Leaf actually told my husband and I that we had to go outside and lay in the hammocks. <laughs> so he set up the hammocks for us and we all came outside and I knit for maybe two rows. And then I just got tired and I don't usually take naps. I feel like you know, my day is disappearing if I take a nap. Sorry, somebody just laid an egg. Um, but I laid down in the hammock and I pulled the hammock closed over me because the sky was bright, it was sunny yesterday morning. I pulled the hammock over me, and I was like, I'm just going to close my eyes for a minute. And my hammock had all my knitting stuff and everything in it. But, And then my husband and son were sitting in the other hammock chatting. And then I woke up to this very loud noise. <laughs> Super loud. And I was like, what is going on? I thought some machine was outside the hammock or something. You have the hammock open. The sky is black, and no one else is around. My husband and son had gone inside. They left all their stuff in the hammock. My husband... Uh, Leaf, my son, had all you know, books and stuffed animals and all that stuff out in the hammock. So I look at the sky, and then I look to my left where I hear the sound coming from, and there's a sheet of rain heading my way. You can't, like in some places where it's super flat, like in Florida, you can see the rain coming at you when it comes. You can't usually around here, except when it comes from that corner over there, and you can hear it coming over the mountain. And I look, and it's just heading towards me, and I was like, ah! Of course, I just woke up, so I'd been in the middle of a dream. Felt like I was in some kind of crazy 
world, grabbed all my stuff, grabbed both the hammocks, and I start running into the house. And it's like right behind me. I'm running from this wall. It was like a movie scene. Who cares if I had gotten a little wet? But for some reason in my mind, it was like acid rain, and I was going to die if I got hit by the by the um, drops. So I was running onto the patio, and I hear it start hitting the patio behind me, and I ran through the door, tossed the stuff down, turned around, saw three cats go shoo, 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 inside the door, and the rain started. It was really cool. I had to laugh once it was done, because then I realized it was just a little rain. It wasn't that big a deal. But I was able to get everything in the house and only had one drop hit my heel. <laughs> so anyway, I am hoping some of that rain for you guys who are not getting it right now. I'm going to have a talk with it this afternoon, see if I can send it your way. Split some off to California, some over to Europe to give you guys some rain. And hopefully you will have some ease. Um, I will probably see you before I head to Wool Scouts. I'll podcast a little early, I guess, so that I can say hello before I head out, and then I'll be gone for a couple of weeks. Hope you guys have a great last few weeks of July and beginning of August, and I'll chat with you soon.